life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details, and survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello. Hello. And welcome to another episode of The Walking Dead, Sunday of the Dead, Season 3, Episode 4, Killer Within. I'm Lainey. I am Marshall. Today we are uh, doing this podcast a, a, not a kind of a little differently. We have a an announcement. Yeah. So we have decided that especially for the holiday season, we're going to be taking a hiatus from doing Sunday of the Dead. But we have some exciting new podcasts, yeah. things we're doing uh, right here on the Elated Geek channel. You're going to see some different book content. You're going to see some holiday movies and TV shows and books uh, that are going to be in our holiday episodes. Plus, we have a brand new uh, segment that mm -hmm. we're going to be calling... Can't Fight Nostalgia. So we're going to take movies from the 80s and 90s and we're going to dissect them and figure out why they were the cult classics that they are and uh, were back mm -hmm. in the day. Let us jump into this episode, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, this is a cliffhanger episode, which is kind of funny that we are going on hiatus right after this cliffhanger yeah. episode starts. It originally aired on AMC in the United States in November 4th, 2012, and was written by Sang Kyu Kim and directed by Guy Ferland. The Killer Within was viewed by 9.27 million viewers, including 4.9% of those in the 18 to 49 demographic upon its initial broadcast in the United States. So still relatively high for mm -hmm. this kind of show yeah and that's a pretty broad demographic it's pretty much most adults most adults except for the boomers right we open this episode in the forest kind of but also the prison it's like just it starts kind of just outside the the prison but it's like moving in correct there is a red propane tank and there is a deer um, and the deer seems to be uh, being placed around places in the prison to keep walkers out of the way? Well, no. Whoever is doing this, and we don't really get to see it, there's this guy who's cutting the chains and the locks on various areas of the prison, basically making it so that places that weren't available are now open. And he's taking these chunks of deer and hanging them all over the place and leaving them to attract walkers. And he's trying to, like, you can see that this person is trying to get walkers into the prison, but we don't know who he is yet, and we don't know why. It could be a girl. Could be, but based off of the way that they walk, it doesn't feel like it. Right. But we don't know any of this information, and it's very mysterious, and we go straight into the intro after that. Then we are back at the prison... They are, the group is moving cars into the prison yard to get it a little bit closer to the main gates. Uh, Glenn and Maggie are up in the guard tower having family time, a fun time, alone time. T Dog notices that Axel and Oscar are coming to talk to them even after they have been banished to D Block. They're supposed to stay there, uh, but. They are coming down to say they don't want to live in the block anymore and they are having a hard time getting rid of the bodies that were shot execution style there. Yeah, and they're saying that they like they really want to get rid of and just make it a home, but they can't move all these bodies by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and they also notice that the main reason that they're having a hard time doing it is because the fence is down on their side. And Rick and the gang don't even seem to mention this. They're like, yep, yeah, okay, cool, whatever, your problem. No. <laughs> this yeah. is everyone's problem. It you really should be is. concerned. Right. But Axel and Oscar are like, they're going to do whatever it takes to be part of the group. So then the, 
the group is like, okay, so they kind of like kick him out, like way outside the gate while they have their discussion. Mm -hmm. But T Dog makes a good point that the group might have more blood on their hands than those two convicts. This was so insightful by T Dog because it was true. This group has done some damage. Yeah. Yeah. And these two convicts have barely killed anyone. Neither one of them had violent no. crimes getting them in there, and they killed maybe a couple of the walkers. They they haven't killed anyone. Yeah, they're not violent people. Um, also, this scene shows how the dictatorship actually functions. When, he, when we left off at the end of season two, we kind of had this impression that Rick was just going to be like, I call all the shots. Doesn't matter. But that's not how he's doing it. He's sitting there calling a council and then making a decision based off of their input. Mm -hmm. um, so th he isn't a bad dictator now that he's calm, but we were all kind of concerned because nobody likes a dictatorship. Correct. Uh, but he is saying that the deal is going to stand. But let's go visit Woodbury. Yay. Michonne is kind of crawling around the... And I wouldn't say crawling, but she's like sneaky looking at the vehicles that were brought in from the army camp. She is looking at the bullet holes. She's looking mm -hmm. at everything that she can see. And she's starting to wonder or confirm that the governor's story may not be exactly what he has said. And the one thing that like, she's kind of like, Ooh, Hey, the bullet holes, that's kind of weird, but that's explainable. Mm -hmm. Then she gets up on top of the Jeep that has the machine gun on it. And she looks down and sees blood spatter on the ground, which in the pattern that it is, that's not something that would be because somebody got bit there. That would have been a spray. Right. Somebody got shot there. Right. So she knows that there's something very wrong with this story. So the governor comes up and he starts telling the story again of what happened. He's trying to recruit Michonne to stay in Woodbury. I think he really identifies that if he can bring her over to his side, she can be a really powerful asset mm -hmm. in taking people out. But what I think his miscalculation is, is he doesn't realize that Michonne is not easily bendable to what he wants done. She can see right through him. Yeah. And this is like a master class in sussing out a liar as a leader because she is trying to talk to him in terms of as if she trusted him, but just didn't understand certain things and giving him a chance to just choke on his own leash. <laughs> yeah. One last lie. Well, I wouldn't say it's the last lie, but one more lie by the governor. He says that they cremated the pilot of the helicopter when he died, but we very clearly saw his head in the fish tank yep. at the top of his mountain of fish tanks. At the prison, the group is having a discussion about what supplies should they give to the prisoners. And T-Dog, T-Dog, still a very large teddy bear. He wants to save everybody. He wants to bridge the gap between the prisoners and the group because he really feels like they could be an asset to them. Mm -hmm. So Daryl, let's talk a little bit about his motorcycle. I finally looked up and did a little research on his motorcycle. And the reason why we're even talking about it is because Axel is like, oh, hey, that's a bike and it's this bike. I want to help you because there's some problems that I can hear in its engine. Mm -hmm. He's trying to suck up, but... You know. But still. But yeah, so tell us about this motorcycle. The the motorcycle that Daryl is driving is a Triumph motorcycle. It has two cylinders and it has two lightning bolts, meaning there's lightning bolt decals on the side of it. Actually, those aren't lightning bolts. Those are SS insignias um, from Nazi Germany. Okay, the original Triumph has two lightning bolts. Ah. The bike was customized. <laughs> That's why it has that instead of the lightning bolt. I get you. Um, in 1971, it was a Triumph Bonneville 650 with a 1969 motor. Hmm. The Triumph Motorcycles Limited is the largest UK-owned motorcycle manufacturer. It was established in, 18, in 1983 by John Bloor after the original company, Triumph Engineering, went into receivership. 
So Axel offers to tune up the bike for Daryl. Now, what's really funny about the scene is 11 and a half minutes into this episode, that's basically where this is taking place. Daryl drives his bike toward the main gate and Axel tells him, well, you know, there's something wrong with it. I can fix it for you. And then Glenn is closing the gate. And to the right of the screen, you can see a a crew member in a white shirt. You can see like the back of his Mm -hmm. back and the legs. Yeah. Yeah. He's just leaning against the fence or she, I can't really tell. I think it's male, but it could be anybody. Right. They're just leaning against the fence where they didn't think that the shot was going to be. Right. Which is weird because it's literally right there. Like he drives right past them. Anyway, uh, Beth and Lori have also found some crutches for Herschel, which is awesome. Um, but when Beth and Lori walk by Carl, Carl's kind of just sitting on the stairs or whatever. Beth kind of gives Carl this like happy look, but not really happy. It's It feels like that kind of look you give somebody when you're like, yeah, everything is good here. Please just stay on your side of the fence. <laughs> it's that kind of a look. Right. In Woodbury, Michonne is talking to Andrea, and she says she wants to leave and go to the coast, find a boat, and an island. And if they did this, they might have found Oceanside. That's correct. They probably would have, yes. And you can totally see Michonne and um, Andrea, you can see Michonne and Andrea just totally making out well in Oceanside. They would just be perfect there. They really would. So Michonne suggests to Andrea that they head for the coast, like we said, and hopefully they find a boat. So like in the TV series Fear the Walking Dead, Victor Strand is the only other character in the two zombie apocalypse shows to suggest this to their group. And we know in From Fear the Walking Dead, they do get on the boat. They do go somewhere. It doesn't turn out that great for them. So, (laughs) yeah. Miss Shone's gut says there's something off about this place. So she says this to Andrea. And it might have something to do with that guy that is being told to just constantly follow them around and watch them. Right. Creeper. The creeper. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what even makes this weird, and I, we mentioned it in the last episode, is the way that the the governor calls this guy my man. Mm-hmm. It felt very kind of almost condescending and it doesn't sound very good for a white guy to say that about a black guy oh that's true yeah it doesn't feel right when we visit the prison again glenn gives oscar and axel some food which is supposed to last them a week Mm -hmm. oscar keeps giving axel a hard time for being like kind of beta about all their relationship here with the the major group but i mean it's the only way they can get into the group um because the way that Rick responds to these people, he does not trust them. Des- he cannot bring himself to trust them. So you have to present yourself as a non-threat. You have to present yourself as a support. And that's the only way eventually you'll get in. But mm. ironically, Rick responds more to Oscar. Yeah, that's Because true. he doesn't submit, but he shoots straight. Um, Rick mentions that he'd rather not farm in walker-rotted soil while they're kind of doing some of this stuff. They're kind of getting some supplies up, and they're trying to move some of the supplies out. He says um, that he'd rather not farm in walker-rotted soil, but I don't think that's going to make much of a difference. Honestly, I think that rotting... Uh, animals and corpses and things like that actually enriches the soil. I, if I remember correctly, I could be totally wrong. It totally does. The only thing is that he's thinking about is he isn't sure about the mechanics of any viruses. Mm-hmm. But now that we've kind of figured out the zombie, the quote unquote zombie virus from them biting you is just sepsis. Right. So as they uh, are continually moving the cars closer to Block C, they're kind of have driven it. It looks like through that corridor, mm-hmm. and so the there are a bunch of cars now that are even closer to Block C than if they were in the yard area. Uh, but you do have to kind of go through the fence in order to get close to the building. Rick and Glenn have brought back firewood. This is very helpful. Uh, Maggie and Beth and I think Lori are... Oh, no, Maggie is with the cars, but Beth and Lori bring Herschel out on Mm -hmm. their crutches. You know, Maggie's really happy to see her dad is up and about. And if you see Daryl in the same shot, he is also... He's about to cry. Mm -hmm. Like, this is a lot of emotion out of this dude. Right. For seeing 
one of their own continue to walk. Well, I don't know if that's the only thing because I think there's actually something very deeper here that it didn't occur to me until just now. Oh, is yeah. that he's looking at Herschel with the fact that Herschel just lost his leg to a bite, but he is surviving. And with Merle, that's kind of the same thing. Merle mm-hmm. didn't lose it to a bite, but he did lose an appendage. And there is a possibility that Merle could still be alive, which we know is true. Yeah. But, yeah, you're totally right. That is exactly what Daryl's thinking. That's that's some good acting, because I didn't right. even realize that that's what he was thinking, but he's thinking that. That's right, good right, stuff. yeah. So Lori and Rick have kind of a moment also, um, and then you, you kind of pan over and you see Carl, and you see a load of walkers coming into the yard, probably from that fence mm-hmm. that Alex, Alex, no, that <laughs> Axel and Oscar were telling them about. So poor Herschel, just learning to walk on his crutches, is kind of like scrambling to get out of the way. Um, Glenn is trying to close the fence hole. And then they're, like, Herschel's trying to go up the stairs, and a walker is chasing him, and he kind of turns around and hits him with a crutch. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, but then T-Dog can see that the back gate is open. Remember from the beginning of the episode where mm-hmm. someone left the back gate open. Somebody was actually cutting the lock on the back gate. And now um, one of the things that we do see is Herschel and Beth both go up the stairs and into kind of the, this caged-in area. But there isn't a lock on it. So he uses his crutch to block it and make it so that the gate can't be opened. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this crutch is now suddenly a multitask tool. All you gotta do is add some blades to the end of that sucker, and mm-hmm. like, now it's totally a weapon. I think we could totally talk about how being disabled doesn't necessarily make you vulnerable in the apocalypse. And when I think about like Fear the Walking Dead, mm-hmm. where uh, the one character is in a wheelchair, mm-hmm. and uh, yes, guys, he actually is in a wheelchair. The actor is having the use of a wheelchair and I love that they wrote this in because I feel like it really shows, you know, Herschel with a crutch, but you know, this guy with a wheelchair, I can't remember his name right now. Yeah. And how they're able to thrive in this environment. So there is still hope. And, you know, for those of you that like to play D and D, all I have to say is combat wheelchair. And you understand all it takes is some ingenuity mm-hmm. and a little mechanical know how, maybe a little bit of help from your friends and you can turn that thing in whatever your tool is to get by into a vital weapon mm-hmm. and a, a, an excellent tool. You can imagine taking that same crutch and stretching, st- strapping a whole bunch of other tools to it right? so that you have a ready-made tool belt everywhere you go. Yeah. On the other side of the prison yard, though, uh, Maggie finds a clear door for Lori and Carl to get safely away from the walkers. It's not C-Block. It's on the other side of the Mm -hmm. yard area but then they get blocked by a group and then they shut themselves in another way so they're just getting blocked really pretty much Mm -hmm. at any angle rick is trying to unlock the front gate to get in and then the convicts rush in Mm -hmm. and they're like kind of trying to help and whatever but then we also see t-dog and carol so they've kind of separated themselves a little bit trying to get away and unfortunately t-dog gets bit and everybody's mad. So mad. All the viewers are mad because T-Dog is so awesome. Yes. So then Carol gets him to go in one of the other doors so they can try to, you know, get away. Um, he keeps he keeps saying, you know, no, you need to leave me here. And she's like, no, I'm not going to. If we go back to Woodbury, Andrea is giving Merle a map of the farm so he can go find Daryl. This seems like it's simple enough, you know, and like harmless enough because she thinks she's trying to help Merle. She thinks she doesn't want to go back to the group because she thinks she was ostracized because she was left behind. So she doesn't want to go back. This is not further from the truth. How selfish can you be, Andrea? Literally, the farm is burning down. The walkers were all over the place and you wanted them to go back for you when they didn't even know if you were still alive? Well, uh, also, she's kind of taking that from how she felt before that. Mm Mm-hmm that a lot of the group spent a long time treating her with kid gloves and not letting her have weapons and things like that. It wasn't until the end of the season that she was starting to come into this position of power. So she kind of took the two feelings and blended them together and skipped all the stuff in the middle. Because, yeah, she's a little whiny. But we did 
see that she started to listen to Michonne a little bit more because she asks if the governor is a good man. So she's trying to make her own decision about it. But Merle has his back. Mm-hmm. But we don't really know if Merle is necessarily a good man. Just because Daryl is a good man doesn't mean that Merle is. And his thing was all about, yeah, the governor took care of me when he didn't have to. Mm-hmm. So, yes, he's a good man. But that just means that he was good to you. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily that he's good to everyone. Right. But I really want to know what's happening at the prison right now because that's everyone where the is a prison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's right there. So Rick, Daryl, and Glenn are in the yard fighting the walkers. Herschel's, Herschel says to them, Maggie, Lori, and Carl got into C-Block. Also, T-Dog was bit. Uh, but they think that the convicts were the ones who let the walkers in because they were mad at them. Then an alarm starts to blare, which draws more walkers to the yard. Rick says, well, you know, we can shoot out the speakers, but there's a lot of speakers in this. He prison. actually goes ahead and wastes bullets shooting out the, two of them. But that's really not going to help you here because right. they're all over the prison. Right. Um, Oscar says, well, you know, I, I kind of like worked in the maintenance room or whatever. I know where the generators are, and if we can figure out how to turn off the generators, then we can turn off the alarm. Mm -hmm. So then we see Carl and T-Dog are running through a hallway, and T-Dog wants to do one last heroic thing and get Carol out. Because like he, he's saying, there's no way that I can amputate where my wound is. Mm -hmm. I'm dead, but that doesn't mean I'm useless. Correct. So I'm, I'm going to fight for my last breath to save right. you. And I really have something to say about that a little later. Uh, when things start happening, I do have a big comment comparison. Yeah. We'll get there. Lori is starting to have contractions. Of course, let's have the most inopportune time to have this baby. A bunch of walkers are coming at them from the other side of the hallway. So Carl leads them through the hallway until he finds a room. And the, the marker outside of it says, Power Room Mechanical Authorized Personnel Only. And the walkers don't even notice. They just keep... Because the door. they're not mechanically authorized. That's correct. They are not. So <laughs> then when we turn to Woodbury, and the governor is playing golf. He has this like part of the wall set up so you can get on top of it and shoot golf balls out into the street. He is hitting walkers in the head, which I think is hysterical. Yeah, that's a great way to practice your totally useless aim. Mm -hmm. He makes a comment where he talks about that they should take the women to Augusta and let them play. And that would be this like historical thing. So I was like, wait, what does he mean? So I had to do this whole deep dive into golf and Augusta. Mm -hmm. And here's what I found. Augusta National Golf did not allow women members until they had their first two females join in 2002. Two? 12. 2012. Which wow. was very topical because when did this episode come out? Oh. October of 2012. Wow. Yeah. Uh, one of the first ladies who was allowed to join was Condoleezza Rice. Hmm. I don't know if it was because she was very high politically, they let her go in. I don't know. In 2019, so this was just a couple years ago, the chairman said they had no plans for a women's only master's tournament. Traditionally, golf was a man's sport. And, um, you know, I have heard people refer to it as, you know, gentlemen only, ladies forbidden. I, I think that's a retcon. Definitely. By, by um, misogynists. Actually, I did a little bit of looking and... The original version of the word is a Scottish permutation of the Dutch word golf, which means club. Ah, yes. So golf literally means club. The thing about the Augusta Club, though, is from the time that it was established, they kept their roster a secret. And uh, due to a protest about this in 2002... Not 12. Mm -hmm. 2002. The list of members was made public. The list read like a roster of the Fortune 500 with a member of Congress, some high-level university and chari charity officials, and powerful statesmen thrown in. And it was definitely a white boys, good old boys club. Yeah, it sounds like uh, skull and bones and stuff like that. Yes. So this was very... I don't know, like ingrained. This is kind of what you stereotypically think of, 
you know, Southerners, which is not true of all Southerners. I'm going to put that out there. But this is definitely when they talk about Georgia and Augusta, this is one of those things. Yeah. And the fact that it still hasn't had a women's only Mm -hmm. Masters tournament is... Wow. Just wow to me. Yeah. Just wow. So, yes, taking taking women to Augusta to play golf at that point in 2012 was very historical. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. The governor is golfing on... Uh, so, I, you know, I kind of looked up <laughs> Sonoya, Georgia, mm-hmm. where this is filmed. And uh, not only is Woodbury from there, but also Alexandria. So it'll be interesting when we get to Alexandria to see the difference. But uh, he is golfing on CV Street. That's the name of the street in Sonoya, out of Woodbury. There's a store with an awning to his right. It's the Redneck Gourmet, which is now closed. Um, As well as the takeout to the entrance to McGuire's Pub, which actually that entrance is no longer used for McGuire's Pub for some reason. If you look at, like, for some reason, like, my Google Maps was funky, and I saw a previous Uh picture, but then the next day I came back and saw a completely different picture, so I don't know what's true or not, but I did see that there was a takeout uh, door for Mm McGuire's Pub. Behind Merle is a chocolate and gelato gelato shop and an Allstate insurance. The chocolate and gelato shop is no longer there also. Merle reveals that he knows where the farmhouse is that Daryl was living because he got that map from Andrea. So he volunteers to go on his own to find him. And then, like, the governor's kind of like, no, I kind of can't spare you, but when we get some more evidence or when other things, blah, 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 blah. Merle starts getting insistent. And then the governor has this moment. He looks right back up at him, and his rage is visible in his eyes. But he covers it up, but it shows that he really doesn't like people disagreeing with him. Yeah, he has such a self-esteem problem. Oh, so much. Well, we get back to the action at the prison, and Rick is screaming Carl and Lori's name, trying to find them as he's taking the zombies out in the cell block. But, and here's that scene. The scene that I totally remember and thought was a lot longer than it actually was. Maggie is preparing Lori for childbirth, but Maggie says, you know, she doesn't have any experience with, with, I don't got no experience birth and no babies, basically. I don't necessarily believe that she has no experience with birth as she grew up on a farm and there were animals and the cows and the cattle, there was birthing season. You know how to give birth to animals. Um, it's a little bit different with people, but not a lot. But she she actually, I think she mentions that, like, I, I worked on farms, we gave birth there, but I've never done one for a human and... This is a C-section. A C-section, right. Like, everybody is aware that Carl was born by C-section, so this baby is going to have to be born by C-section. Mm-hmm. Well, also because, you know, she's bleeding. And normally when you're bleeding like that, it means there's something wrong. Yeah. Carl looks really uncomfortable. As you can only imagine a child of his age would when he sees his mother bleeding <laughs> and, uh, you know... He's literally watching this whole labor process, right? So, yeah. like, completely wide open. Like we said, Lori, she, she keeps trying to push, but she can tell there's something wrong with mm-hmm. what is happening. When we go to see uh, T-Dog and Carol, he throws himself at a big group of walkers so she can escape. Carol was originally going to be killed off in this episode, but producers decided to scrap the idea and look at her now... One of the OG. Yeah. She Still is, around. She just turned into like a major character. Really, this is also where she really begins her metamorphosis. Because mm-hmm. like the cocoon has already opened, but now the wings are unfolding right. soon. And we really get to see her. So this whole situation of T-Dog throwing himself at the walkers really is what they should have done with Big Tiny. Mm-hmm. Instead of Tomas shooting Big Tiny in the head or whatever it was he did, they should have been like, okay, well, as long as you're alive, you need to be the tank. You need to basically be the one who goes mm-hmm. out in front. That's because Tomas was not right in the head. No. He was no. not right in anybody's head. In Woodbury, Michonne is sitting in the uh, 
kitchen, staring, death staring at her katana that's shut up in a cabinet. There's also a gun, some gold plates, and a pitcher. Mm-hmm. I don't really understand the significance of this collection of items unless they're like his treasure. Well, the the gun is most likely Andrea's gun. Oh, yeah, okay. So they're holding their weapons in this cabinet. Mm-hmm. So Andrea is talking to the governor about what they're going to do, you know, when they're leaving. She tells the governor that she, quote unquote, lost her family, her parents and her sister, implying that she knows that her parents are dead. However, in Vatos, the episode in season one, Andrea and Amy speculate that their parents are still alive and that maybe Florida wasn't hit so bad. There is no indication that Andrea knows one way or another whether her parents are alive or dead. And I understand where she's coming with this Mm -hmm. because, you know, you can just assume they're probably not alive. Uh, But still, not for certain. So then Andrea says she hasn't had a drink for a while, but then she decides she's going to have a drink with the governor, right? At this point, there has been this whole cagey thing where, like, the governor is has been talking to Andrea, and Andrea's like, what's your name? And he's like, I'm never going to tell you. And she's like, never say never. So at this point, he decides he's going to tell her his name is Philip, which I think is basically to try to win points, win her over an intimate connection with that she knows the secret of his. Yeah. You know, uh, well, we can also that. see that in the scene where he went to go to his tank full of walker heads, there was a woman in bed with him. Yeah, there was. That's true. And I don't know who that woman was. Mm -mm. It may be that he's also a little bit of a womanizer. Yeah, could be. And so he is using this as kind of like, I'm going to try and forge an emotional connection with her so she'll be connected to me and devoted to me. And then I've got another woman not only living here in the town to build up the town, but also on the side. Right. At the prison, Rick, Daryl, and Oscar are trying to shut down the generators. But surprise, Andrew pops up. He's been, like, hanging out in the laundry room. I don't know. Um, he, like, is trying to beat Rick up. Then. And he, he, like, you look at him. He's got the same crazy eyes that... Um, uh, Domas had. Yes. And this kind of shows, oh, this is the guy who's been doing all of this. Mm-hmm. He's the one that's been opening up the gates. Because he, one of the things he attacks Rick with is the same axe that we saw the other guy, the, the intruder using. Mm-hmm. So Oscar makes the decision to pick side and he ends up shooting Andrew. At this point, I do want to point out, where are Glenn and Axel? Yeah, I I know that they came in, yes, they but did. I don't know what happened to they them. They were not in the scene at all. Wow. Yeah. The other thing that I noticed is that um, uh, Oscar chucks a diesel can at Andrew's head, like, wank, like gives him a good old hit before he shoots him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was like, whoa, okay, yeah, you, you are angry at this guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but then after, after he kills Andrew, Rick looks at him and just gives him a simple nod like welcome to the crew Mm -hmm. this is the moment where he's like you're with us you're good so then there's this really short silly little scene that it was like just so weird andrea is starting to change her mind about staying she's wishing washing again um so she's like first yeah we can go and now after talking to the governor she wants to stay Turns out his manipulation was working. Mm-hmm. Um, Michonne is really not happy about all this because she can suspect exactly why she thinks this way. And again, this was a weird, yeah. like, two-second scene, like, made no sense. So then we go back to the prison. We want to know what's happening with Lori. And Lori shows Maggie her old C-section scar and says, So this is where I had Carl, and this is your guide. So now you know exactly where to cut to get the baby out. Helpful, but also wow. <laughs> Yeah. Right? So then Lori starts to prepare Carl for what is going to happen. She is telling him, you know, this is how you need to carry on. This is how whatever, what happens. If I die, I need you to do this. Maggie is terrified of what is happening right now. Lori tells Maggie she will have to take her out if she dies. But not in so many words. Like, she basically is, like, very flowery about the fact that she does not want to turn into a zombie. Yeah. 
I have a lot of notes about the background for the scene and what happened. I watched a featurette about it. The featurette was longer than the actual scene. <laughs> um, so here we go. So Lori, who's the actress Sarah Wayne Callies, drew on her real life childbirth experience, which she describes as a battle. Sarah says Lori always saw her pregnancy as a death sentence. And to prepare, she viewed the Stanley Kubrick directed war film, Full Metal Jacket. Very interesting. The scene was so troublesome for Lauren Cohen, who plays Maggie, that she nearly quit the show when she read that she had to do this. It wasn't until a talk with co-star Stephen Yoon, who is Glenn, that she changed her mind and continued with the show. So Glenn supported Maggie and Maggie kept on. Yes, exactly. Wow. So nice. So nice. So Lori's belly prosthetic is a belly that is glued onto a swimsuit. So she Mm kind of pulls it up. um, And then until you get to the C-section portion, which is a, uh, the C-section portion of the show, which is an actual glued on belly. So she was saying that she had to wear the swimsuit belly like any other time underneath her clothes. So they put her down on the floor, they glued this belly on her, and they had a tube that runs from the belly up and over her her shoulder to her back. And they were like off to the side pumping fake blood into this tube into the fake belly so that there would be blood all over the place. Um, and she said that she got stuck to the floor because it was so sticky yeah. with the fake blood. So then they would use a real knife to cut into the prosthetic, which to me is terrifying in and of itself. The baby was a radio-controlled prop baby with moving arms and legs that they used for the actual birth scene. But then they switched over to an actual baby, which was a set of twins, and they were six-week-old Adelaide Cornwall and Eliza Cornwell. And their uncle, Brandon Cornwell, had a role in The Walking Dead in episode nine, which is coming up in Suicide Kings. He plays a Woodbury survivor. Um, In episode 10 and 16, Welcome to the Tombs, he is also in those episodes. So it's very like family connection. Uh, So that is basically all the technical aspect about all of that. Right before Lori passes out, she utters the phrase, good night, love. Who is she speaking to? Um, I'm thinking she's speaking to Judith. You don't think it includes Carl there? Maybe Carl. And maybe Rick. I mean, she still loves Rick a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So here's one thought I had. They aren't really disinfecting anything, so it's a wonder that this baby fares as well as it does. It might also be why Judith is so hardy. Maybe. She She's um, right from birth. She's already being around all this death and destruction and mm-hmm. she survives it so right. nothing can kill her later well especially because carl then offers his shirt to wrap the baby this shirt that has been around zombie guts this shirt that has been around dirt and grime that is not a pun but mm-hmm. dirt and grime um to the baby now normally you think of i need boiling water to sanitize i need fresh towels and linens to wrap the baby in so they're not susceptible to infection Judith gets none of this. Yeah. None of it. I mean, there was a period in time where boiling water and antiseptics and all that stuff just didn't exist. True. Well, boiling water, I think, almost always existed. You had to clean the baby off. Yeah. But, you know, there's a time before we realized how to use fire. Well, it's really interesting, too, that, like, they now live in this world where blood and guts is kind of a way of life. And... Carl immediately gives Judith to Maggie and Maggie's holding the baby and she's already like traumatized about what's happening, but they don't try to clean the baby off at all. They just let it go. Right. Mm -hmm. He then Carl then says after he hands the baby over that Lori is his mother and he needs to kill her before she turns. So one of the featurettes I was watching was how Carl becomes, goes from a child to a soldier, basically, 
uh, he does what he has to do in order to protect his family, much like Rick had to protect his family, especially with Shane. But one of the things that I, I find so ironic is that not two episodes ago, Carl is like, or maybe it was even the last episode, Carl is like behaving kind of like a child and like talking back to his mother. And then all of a sudden he has to grow up in this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, he is stone faced when he walks out of the room, out of the prison, because of what he had to do. So there's a tradition where, during the show, where whatever scene a character dies in, uh, primarily a primary character that's been around for a while, the cast, the crew, the writers, everyone go to the monitors and they watch the taping of them dying and uh there was a big point they were making about it in this instance where that's what happened with Lori because it is season three she's been around for three seasons now so this was kind of a very major death rick daryl and oscar and glenn but no axel <laughs> shows up in the hallway and sees a dead zombie there's also a pink scarf that belonged to carol mm -hmm. too but she is not there also where did Glenn come from? Also, where is Axel? Oh, there he is. Uh, then he like pops up in the back there. I don't know. So maybe they, they were dealing with zombies out in the hall. That's maybe. where they were. But So then Herschel asks if they found everyone. And then all of a sudden, they hear an, a baby crying. And then Rick sees his daughter Judith for the first time. Maggie looks devastated, traumatized. She can't even talk. She just goes up to Glenn, and Glenn's like, oh, okay, what happened now? You know, he's trying to, like, console her, because obviously everyone can put two and two together because Lori isn't there. And Carl has his same stone-faced look on, and Rick comes over, and he looks at him and realizes the whole story, that not only did Lori give birth to Judith and died but that Carl was the one that had to end her. Mm -hmm. And I th like the logic of his brain, he could have handled that Lori was going to die. He was prepared for Lori to die. Mm -hmm. But the death of his son's childhood, that his son had to do it, right. had to kill his own mother, breaks him. Right. That is the moment where he just starts crying and throws himself on the floor mm -hmm. and just balls. But even before that, he has a choral moment. Um, th this is very memeized, um, where Coral yeah. instead of Carl, because I think he, at times, his British accent just kind of comes in a little bit. But yes, yeah. he, he does do Coral. Not Coral. It's not Carol either. It's Coral. <laughs> <laughs> So the memory of the fallen in this episode is honored by a replacement of regular music during the credits and utter silence. So they are marking most notably Lori, but also we think T-Dog mm -hmm. because T-Dog got bit. There's no way he's coming back from that bite. Yeah. Uh, and that is the end of the episode. It's very serious. <laughs> Yeah, um, and kind very of been, tense. Yeah. yeah, we've kind of been working up to this point ever since season two, what will happen now that Lori knows she's pregnant. So let's talk about the title, which is The Killer Within. Um, I feel like it has a double meaning here because not only is it talking about the unborn baby being a threat on Lori's life, but also the killer within could be the mysterious person running around trying to let the zombies into the prison. Who is Andrew? But also, right. this is also referencing the governor. Right. Because he seems like this nice person, but we all know that he is a predator. Yes. Definitely. In the in the sneakiest type of way possible. Um, not the worst villain that we will have on The Walking no. Dead, but definitely the creep one of the creepier ones, I think. I mean, it, when we talk about the villains of The Walking Dead, there is three more major villains that are to come, but one of them I barely even count, 
from uh, Terminus. Mm-hmm. Then you have Negan, who I actually end up liking most of the time. Right. And then Alpha, that I don't, I don't care about. Right. So this is the last time that we have a villain that I am legitimately creeped out about. And right. I feel bad that people have to deal with him. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for joining us on this first part of The Walking Dead recap. Do not forget to join us for our more exciting, not more exciting, but but, but for more exciting episodes of Different Things as we go. We hope you stick around and listen to more on Elated Geek. And if you are interested in seeing more of Sunday of the Dead, we are planning on coming back to that in the future. Um, we don't have a definite date on that yet, but we do plan on coming back. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek. Yeah.